The psalmist calls us to worship and God through the psalmist enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have a great God who has made the heavens and the earth and he has redeemed us by the blood of the lamb. May he now bless us and may we receive his blessing by faith at this time. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 101. The opening hymn is On God Alone My Soul Relies. We are going to hear the word of God uh, declared to us on prayer and the doxology of prayer. And this is what we've been learning that on God alone our soul relies. And we sing that now, stanzas 1, 2, 5, and 6 of 101. It is the tradition uh, passed on from the fathers in the Reformed faith that we read uh, the law of God regularly. It's not a commandment that we read this every week, but we read this regularly to uh, learn some very important things. And number one is our sin. From the law of God, we learn the standard of righteousness and how far we've fallen short of that. But then we learned or were learned and taught in the gospel of Jesus because the law and its condemning force gives us to fly to the only hope, our only one in whom is there, there is no condemnation. That's Jesus Christ. But then the law is a positive and uh, a, in a godly aspect to it in that it promotes the godliness, the godly thanks of the people of God who have a standard we can live by, not according to the world, its opinions, not according to what's popular do we live by that. We live by the old word of God. And so let's consider what we're going to learn this morning, Deuteronomy 5. That's where I'm going to read this morning. And beginning at verse 6, we have this very important prologue to the law. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And for those who don't think that what follows the Ten Commandments applies to the people of God. Remember that if what follows does not apply to the people of God today in the New Testament, for example, nor does the prologue, and the prologue does apply to the people of God. When God said to Israel, I'm your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, there's a picture there of who we are and who God is to us and who God is and who um, we are to him 
in this Egypt bondage and deliverance. You know the picture story of the Old Testament. It's all a picture of the slavery and sin. That's how we're born. We're, we're shackled into sin. Maybe some of you are feeling that way as you come to church even. We're shackled in our prejudice, in our pride, in our carnality. That's easy to, to get like that because we still have this nature within. But look at the amazing word that God says right away to us today in light of the deliverance in Jesus. I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of this house of bondage. And that means we're in God's house, the house of liberty, the house of the glorious outpouring of the Spirit, the house of God, the church of God in the New Testament. Hear what God says to us then as a way of thanks that we want to show and live by. You shall have no other gods before me. You're liberated. You're brought out of Egypt. And God's speaking to Israel. It's about to enter the land of Canaan. Well, you, people of God, you're about to enter the world after church, and you're going to go into Grand Rapids, and you're going to be the ones who shall have no other gods before me. Like the Israelites were called not to have the Canaanite gods for their gods. You shall have no other gods. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember, here's the motivation for keeping the Sabbath day, also the New Testament Lord's Day, in light of the glorious fulfillment of the gospel, the whole day a day consecrated to God. Here's the motivation. Remember this. You were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And the fifth commandment is this. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The sixth commandment, you shall not murder. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And the eighth commandment, you shall not steal. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Those are the ten the perfect law of God written in tables of stone, both sides of the, the tables of stone given to Moses, indicating its, its permanency. It's on stone, and it's engraved on the stone. And now, as New Testament believers, in our hearts, that law, that standard, condemning us as we stand in Adam, but a way of gratitude because we are by faith in Christ. And so we have really two commandments. Because we're loved, here's what Jesus says it's all about. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind too, and with all your soul. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Be loved of God, love him back, and the neighbor for God's sake in the way of godly obedience and thanks. God be praised. We have a word from heaven for our life and that points us to Jesus, our life. Let's now sing in response to the reading of the law 
and to all that God has spoken to us since we've entered his courts. 205 in the Psalter hymnal is a versification, I believe, of Psalm 103. And it's a uh, wonderful celebration of the tender love that a father has. Let's sing the five stanzas, 205. One of the few places is Psalm 103 in the Old Testament that speaks of God as Father. And that's not just a New Testament thing, but certainly the New Testament reveals to us in Jesus, the Son of God, the great fatherhood and the fatherhood blessings of God. But the Old Testament saints knew that too, and certainly we do too. As we come together in prayer at this time, congregation, those who may be visiting with us, and maybe visiting and come back to worship with us. Glad to have you here. Uh, let's remember how wonderful our God in heaven is to be our Father, which art in heaven. That's what the Lord's Prayer is all about, as we'll see again this morning. But what a wonderful God who's a wonderful Father to us in heaven. And in this broken world, we all know imperfect fathers of flesh and, and blood and sinful fathers, and not so tender love that a father might have. Maybe even we're in broken homes. But God is our perfect Heavenly Father. And let's remember, too, there's perfect forgiveness, perfect forgiveness in Him, and through faith in Him. Unchanging is the love of the forgiving Father. Remember that as we pray now together. Let's pray. Our God in heaven... Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your glorious name. For you are God and you are our Father and changeless is your love. Glorious and changeless is your love revealed. 
to the sons of men in Jesus Christ, commended for all time and for sinners, is your love, especially when he came and then when he went down, down, down into the pit of hell itself, bearing wrath, your own, on the cross for our sake. Commended and declared now from every pulpit where there is the truth and the spirit of Christ moving men to declare the gospel. Jesus Christ revelation of your love. And we pray, Lord, to know the great liberation he has effected on Calvary. We pray to know by your outpoured spirit and that causing us to be born again and to be revived in our souls the liberty that is now ours through faith and the life of thanks and gratitude to you. We pray, Lord, as we gather together, that there may be nothing that remains that can hinder our believing, believing in the full and free and over and over again forgiveness of you, our God. May it be then, Lord, as we confess our sins, for surely they're many, surely they're grievous against you and one another. And nevertheless, we don't linger there in the mud and in the mire but we go quickly to Jesus. And that's what we do now, Lord. As we enter your gates, it's with thanksgiving and it's anticipation of your speaking to us and feeding us through the declaration of your word and the sacrament. We are confident in you and all of our inglorious sinfulness pales in comparison, is not worthy to be compared to your glory and your love and your forgiveness and your light and your eternity revealed to us in your Son. Bless, Lord, us with the knowledge of you, our God, that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, that you have become our Father, God, that you are our forgiving God, the God of our lives, personally and individually, and as married couple and as those who have families, you are our God. And over every aspect of our life, you rule, not merely by law and justice, but also in mercy, enlightening us and our path, no matter where you may lead us, so that we're led to you. And we're led to see that your domain is indeed universal. You are the king. There is no other kingdom besides yours that is to be compared to that kingdom. You are the sovereign one, the absolute ruler. Yours is the praise and the glory because you show not only power, but grace among the sons of men to redeem them. And Lord, we pray in celebration as your people, as a church of Christ, come together to worship this snowy and blustery day, reminded in the snow itself and in this coldness of winter that you are the God who makes our status to be pure and we are right with you and we are whiter than snow through the robes of Jesus Christ clothing us. We are reminded as we come together and see the saints and see every member of the body of Christ just how glorious you have been in bringing us together, and making us family, and giving us to blend together in that communion which only can be knit by the great and holy spirit of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you bless us with truth. and We pray to continue to be faithful and we pray for your servant with thanksgiving that you have given him to us and also in urgent supplication because we all know he's a weak and sinful man. And you use the, the most foolish of means according to men's estimation, but the good way to deliver a truth from heaven through a man that we're reminded also of the incarnate Savior who is the perfect God and who has come in the flesh and behold, we see in the minister a picture of that Lord Jesus, even though he is very imperfect, but in his office, 
and in the word he brings of the shepherd who lives and reigns at your right hand and who even now is among us. God bless us, we pray, the ministry of elders and deacons, that they may be strong and their ministry may be effectual into the discipline, the godliness of the congregation, and to correcting us when we go astray and to helping us in our needs as we need and rely solely on the mercies of Jesus. Bless, we pray, everyone in trials and tribulations, and we're mindful of the hurts of life and We think of Elizabeth Hoxima as well, who's hurt her foot and may need surgery. God bless her in this tribulation, in this time of of healing. We pray for recovery for her. We thank you that it's not uh, worse than it is. We pray that you would use the means of doctors and surgeons and medicine. However, Lord, you would have her to be healed in the body. And Lord, bless her a little soul but she may also be of big faith and show forth the beauties of the virtues of Jesus in relying upon you. May the whole family and also the church family come together in this need and also with regard to all the needs of our church, those who may be sick, who also may be sin sick and walking in unrighteousness and stubbornness, even keeping themselves from the house of God. God bless them all in the needs of body and soul. This precious flock you've given to be upholder of your sovereign grace and light in Jesus. And bless, Lord, us in our successes, which can oftentimes be temptations as can hard times. We pray in the successes of life. We have more than than we need in the bank and in our retirement accounts. We may rely only on Jesus and not be so full that we are full of ourselves and we leave off prayer and godliness. And Lord, you know all our needs, the needs too of those who may be in distant places and those who may be vacationing or attempting to come back home. Would you bless them, Lord, and keep them, make your face to shine upon them and give them each Sabbath day to worship you. God, we pray, bless us and bless not only us, but your people wherever they may be, We're just a little band here, but your church is big, universal, from every nation, tribe, and tongue you're calling them. Many are being persecuted as we speak, as we pray, God bless them. Bless them who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, that they may know the great care of the King of kings and the one whose is all the glory. God bless us in our need to believe in this age which would hinder, frustrate, and even thwart altogether our faith and that of our young people. God, have mercy. Have mercy upon the people of God also in this campus that you may, Lord, cause them to be strong and not to put off religion even as they go to a Christian college. May it be that they're strong in the ordinances that you give and and being members of your church and hearing Jesus every week. We pray, hear our prayers and give us to pray. We've been considering, Lord, the truth of prayer in our discussion of the Lord's prayer and the preaching. Lord, may it be that we pray. That's the result of the sermons on prayer, a praying people. And as we hear this morning, may it be for a God-praising, praying people, because you are worthy of all praise. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We do pray in the pardon of our sins through faith and our union with Jesus. Amen. Your offering at this time will be received for the general fund of this church.
Let's turn in our Psalter hymnals to number 14, Wholehearted Thanksgiving to Thee I Will Bring. Let's bring Thanksgiving as we sing the three stanzas. Well, let's sing stanzas one, two, and four, the first two and the last of 14. Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the well-known Sermon on the Mount, the not-so-well-understood Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, recall, is speaking to and of the kingdom people. He starts out pronouncing blessing upon them and then uh, tells them their glad marching orders in the fulfillment of the Old Testament that he is and gives the spiritual understanding to the disciples. And in Matthew 6, that's where we're going to turn at this time. He's been speaking of uh, godlinesses and duties, pious duties of the people of God with regard to their charity, their charitable deeds, with regard to their 
praying as well. And we have been considering the Lord's Prayer, and I want to pick that up again. And We've been considering this whole Lord's Prayer in the light of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, and let's begin at verse 5 and through uh, verse 15. When you pray, hear the words of our Lord, Matthew 6, verse 5, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's as far as we'll read God's word, and it lives and abides forever, and may it have a living and abiding place in our hearts as we receive it, and also as we receive the preaching of the word on this text and the doxology of the prayer. For yours is the kingdom, speaking of God, Jesus says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is, I say, one of the outstanding features of the Sermon on the Mount. It's well known, and many people quote it, many ungodly people quote it, and they go to this bare bones and, and misunderstood and even warped religion of the Sermon on the Mount without the sermons on the cross and without the sermons on the greatness of God, but they would somehow twist the Sermon on the Mount to apply to their religion. One of the ways that people twist the Sermon on the Mount and everything that Jesus had to teach about prayer is to think that prayer is something that we give to a God who's like Santa Claus and that we make as those who have it coming to us. And so prayer is all about petitions and our rights and we're asserting our rights. No, it's not. We know about that. Prayer, in fact, as we're taught even in this last doxology that Jesus gives to us, is about praise and about giving glory to God. When Jesus Uh, teaches the disciple to end their prayer for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He's enlisting the disciples into this prayer that's praise. And if they'd only have noted that, it already was a prayer of praise when they started out. For we locate God in heaven. We call him our Father in heaven. And our first petition is the hallowing of the name of God. And then the second is that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now we're finishing the whole business of prayer with a doxology, an outstanding word of praise. But little known as well, not only that prayer is about praise, but little known is that Jesus himself was all about this. Jesus himself is the one who would give glory to God the Father, It was not about giving glory even to himself, even though he could have done that. And even at this point in the prayer, he could have reminded everybody uh, of the truth that in the Father or in the Son, the Father is glorified. And through the Son's working, the kingdom comes. But he doesn't do that here. Amazing. You see, I think that Jesus is almost self-effacing here and, and not wanting the attention on himself because otherwise maybe the 
Maybe the disciples would have made a, a mere hero out of Jesus. Or be that as it may, he's pointing to the Father in heaven. Jesus was all about this. He came not to do his own will, but the Father's. And he came so that God the Father would get the glory even in the salvation that Jesus accomplished for the elect of God. But now, at this important conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus reminds the disciples, make it end on a note of praise. May your prayers be doxological, that is, words of praise, Jesus is saying. And then and only then, we have the right to say amen to our prayers. See, lots of our prayers, they're all about us, aren't they? And they hardly get off the ground because we're so anxious when we pray and we're thinking maybe God won't answer us. And, okay, we'll quickly pray, but we'll very quickly go to the doctor or we'll very quickly do this and that and we'll leave off thinking about our care in God. Well, Jesus wants us to linger on praise and then we can say amen and then we can show we truly believe the God we pray to. So I want to just reflect with you on this conclusion of prayer, which is not a conclusion, I hope, to our praying, but a beginning of praise, prayer, praise and amen prayer. That's my theme, praise and amen. First of all, let's consider that prayer is praise of the children of God. Then secondly, I want to consider that prayer is the prayer of believers in the midst of a scoffing age. And finally, a very important thing to remember about prayer in this doxology too is that it's all for disciples of Jesus and those who are attached to him in that faith that he gives. Well then, fascinating, whatever you want to call this doxology at the end of the prayer, it's a, an outstanding statement. Let's put it that way. It's an outstanding statement of the great God we believe in. You know, we here have a name, Sovereign Grace, United Reformed Church, and others have names, too, that, that bespeak of the greatness of God, his great grace, his great covenant, his great fellowship with his people. But do we really get that, that God is really great and greatly to be praised, as the psalmist of old said? Well, here's a statement. Jesus is making a statement here, and, and we are to have this or something like it in our minds as we pray, he says. This statement, this truth, God's is the kingdom, God's is the power, and God's is the glory forever. That's how you read it, children. You put the word God's in there. God's, he's the one who has the kingdom. He is the kingdom. His is the power, and his is the glory forever. That's what we say amen to at the end of our prayer and I think the idea, don't you, is that we should be thinking about this throughout our praying to our Father in heaven. Well, God's is the kingdom. That means he's king. That means he has a rule and a government. It means he has a domain. You know, earthly kings have earthly territory. Not so many of them nowadays, but when Jesus says God's is the kingdom, well, he's not limiting God's kingdom in any, in any way whatsoever. His is the universe as a kingdom. He makes the heaven his throne and the earth his footstool, the Bible says. He's that great big a king and is the only king in this kingdom. That's what Jesus is reminding us of here. He's the only king, the only monarch, the absolute one. And if they think that if the saying is true that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, not so with God. He has absolute power, and it's not to corrupt him, but it's because he is the God who is the king, and he has the right, you see, to be there. He's the creator, and so the creator is the king of all his creation. No other king can be said uh, that of, that he creates his subjects. Well, God does. He creates the earth. He creates the sea. He creates the Leviathan. He creates you and me and everything. And even devils are under that kingdom of God, that reign, that sway, that scepter of God. And that scepter is called his power. And that's why Jesus go on to say that God's is the kingdom and the power. 
You see, he's not a king who is limited in his reign because, well, maybe there's opposing forces and, and he doesn't have the absolute sway that he would desire. No, God's is the power. And even though there be other earthly powers and even devilish principalities, even though it's true, as Jesus says, that the, 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 the Satan is the strong man who's the prince of this world, the prince of darkness, grim, nevertheless, God is the king who has all the power. And whatever power and uh, force devils even may have, or earthly Caesars, God is the one who dispenses the power. Remember when, when the devil wanted to tempt Job? Well, God allowed the devil to tempt Job, but he put the devil on a leash. And that's always how the devil is to be viewed. He's a dog on a leash and he's serving the will of God. God is that great of an owner and a master, even of beings that would go against him morally. His is the kingdom. He rules, and he has the right, therefore, and he has the power to get it done. To get what done? His will. His will. His will on earth as it is in heaven. He is the power, powerful king with a great decree. And for all of these reasons and, and more, as the Bible describes them in great detail, God's is the glory. Now, that's a word here that Jesus uses to remind us when we pray to give God weight. And the Hebrew word glory, kavod, is weight. There's a weightiness of God. And how few people give God the weight and the glory and their considerations of everything. We can go hither, thither, and yon and look out and say it's snowing and, and forget that God is the one who, who is the one who sent the snow and who's blowing it and, and withholding his breath as he wills. His is the glory. His is the one who is virtuous in everything. He's the one who is great and greatly to be praised for all his goodness. You see, he's not just a brute and powerful God and some absolute monarch that has no care about being good. No, he's good. He's wise. He's loving, he's righteous. This is what Jesus is saying. Reminding the disciples of everything they knew from the Old Testament and leading them to, to speak of even greater things of God in light of him who's come, even Jesus, of whom we'll, we'll see presently he is the revelation of this kingdom and power and glory. Jesus leading the disciples to this truth as God reveals it. And this forever truth, Note that, the significance of that word forever. God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You see, if the reign of the monarch is only temporary, there would be something limiting to him, wouldn't there? There would be something fleeting in his greatness and in his glory. It would be like our glories, the glories of men. They come and they go. Or the glory of a comet that is in the stars for a while, in the skies, and then it goes and it burns out and we never see it anymore. Well, that's this temporary thing, which is not God's temporary thing. He has no temporary thing about him. He's a forever God. Before the earth was formed, uh, formed and the, the, the foundations of the earth were established, God is God. And God is God in history, not compromised may be limited in his knowledge, as some like to think God is, when he engages in history. No, he's God. And then after history, when time as we know it will be no more, he's God, forever God. Forever God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The kingdom, the power, the glory, and the forever. Well, you, work, you love the words, the? Every word in the Bible is so significant. Pronouns, prepositions, definite articles, thes. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not just a way that you can choose or don't have to, or a life, or a truth. God is not just a God. His is not just a kingdom. His is not just a power. His is the kingdom. His is the power. His is the glory. His is the forever. Well, it's important for the disciples to remember that statement of truth. And it's important for us when we pray to remember truth. Not just, I hope I can feel God when I'm praying. 
I hope I can let go and let God when I'm worshiping. Prayer is for intelligent people, that is, those who have an understanding of things. And our understanding of things is by the enlightenment of our mind with truth. And Jesus gives us a statement here to remember the truth of the God to whom we pray. Our Father, he's in heaven. Remember that. Remember to hallow his name and remember to pray for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, because there's this truth underlying the whole business, if I can say that reverently. Truth, the truth of God. And there's the link, you see. There's a little word for another important word here. It's not just a statement of truth at the end of the prayer that Jesus makes. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I'm going to give you a theological lesson at the end of this prayer. But it's intimately related to the rest of the prayer Jesus is saying here. Pray this and remember it's because or for God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever that you can pray and you can pray with confidence. That's what he's saying. And let's have this as a word of admonishment and rebuke, maybe, or certainly of guidance from your pastor and from Pastor Jesus through Pastor Dick. Remember, let it be that all of our learning is for praying, is for doing, is for being Christian. That's what Jesus is doing here ever theological, ever concerned about the glory of the God of truth and the truth of the God of the glory in our praying. Of all things, Jesus is saying, remember you're praying all of this because of all that God is, all the greatness that I reveal to you of God. And that's so very important that, first of all, we be reminded that we're depending on God in our praying. Think of that. The whole, the whole lessons on prayer of Jesus is lessons on God dependence. So we pray. We're praying to our Father in heaven. And we're remembering that he is the one who has the kingdom, the power, the glory forever, and so on. And we're not, when we pray, therefore, going to our banker or going straight to the doctor or trusting in ourselves, God forbid. No, Jesus would take us away from self. And as our catechism in, we'll say, 45, I believe, when it began this, this exposition of prayer and we've been following that and following the Word of God, it reminds us that when we pray, it's like we're nothing. And it is that God is everything. And this is the point of this doxology at the end. So we're reminded that we have to include this attitude in prayer that says, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm just a speck of dust and a sinful speck of dust at that. And that's why we pray in our first petition that God's name would be hallowed, not our name. You see, this is the end of Babel here. Babel and, you know, the tower that Nimrod and his cronies built in Genesis, and which tower is picture of the tower of man and the kingdom of man. You know how Babel's built? One man stepping on another man. One man and two men and two or three gathered together in the name of man to build the kingdom of man. One prayerless act by another and after another, one uh, self-satisfaction in the work of man after another, that's how Babel is built. Well, this prayer is for the building of the kingdom of heaven with God as its king. And one prayer of a man who's no man, a woman, a girl, someone in need, after another to the God who can provide needs, that's how the kingdom of God is built. That's why it's so important to get this doxology. And the first thing we do is we're, we're saying here, it's not about our name. It's about the hallowing of the name of God. It's not about our kingdom. It's not about our bank account. It's about God's kingdom coming, his will being done. For he's worthy, Jesus says. That's the link 
between the beginning and the end of the prayer. And then it changes everything about how we pray for bread even. Ever think of that? First petition for us and for our bodily needs is, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Don't you think that you can be confident then when you pray? If you're praying in light of the doxology, God's is the kingdom, God's is the power, God's is the glory forever. God's is the wheat fields, God's is the supermarkets, God is the medicine, and God's the doctors. He is everything, you see. That's what this means. And so when you're praying with regard to the stuff you need, and God's is, he's, he's the Lord of the economy, God's over Wall Street, God's over your boss, God's over you, when you pray in light of the king of kings, everything is his domain, even the church. Lovely doxology. Great confidence booster that when we pray our daily bread, God's going to move heaven and earth to give us the daily bread and also cause the crops to grow as much as you need, as much as is good for you. And don't you think then that this God, children, and young people and older people and old-timers like myself, don't you think that this God who is the kingdom can forgive us? Don't you think he cares for the needs of our soul? He can forgive us. He will forgive us because he's our Father in heaven. And don't you think that he's able to lead us not into temptation and so that we're into, into temptation, as we saw last time, into its clutches, and so that he can deliver us from evil? Don't you think that he will be able to deliver us and he is willing because we are his children? Yes. That's my God. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And so I'm confident. You too? That's my second point. We're confident. We, we take this statement of Jesus and we make it. And we believe it. And we pray we pray, believing that God's is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And I hope you realize what a gift this is. Do you have faith? You have faith? You have a gem. You have a great gem in your possession. For faith joins you to Jesus, the greatest thing. And all the gemnologists and all of the others who are experts in rubies and the valuing of all diamonds and Petoskey stones and whatever else we value, if they're spiritual about them, they'll look at these things and these rubies and diamonds and silver and emeralds and gold and so on, and they'll say they don't compare to the gem that's faith because faith joins us to God, Hebrews tells us. Hebrews 11, verse 1. And faith is the substance of things not seen, and it's the evidence of things hoped for. It's this wonderful connecting link, this great gift from the cross of Calvary that we have so we can know God and pray to God and be confident that I'll hear. I say that's a rare gift. And we live in this rare era of faith, and at every turn, the devil wants to destroy your faith and mine. He does. He did last week. You know that? You realize that? I hope you came into church and you were cognizant in some degree that this week, this past week, was a battle. It was a battle to believe what you say you believe. It was, it was a no-holds-barred battle between you and the devil and you and the flesh and you and the world. That's what this week was. I hope you understand that. And that's why we come to the table of the Lord, too, for the strengthening of our faith. And that's why we'd hear the word to work our faith. It's that bad. There's lots of Caesars, isn't there? Little Caesars and great Caesars. And they all contend for our allegiance. And they all want us to be ruled by them. And they're Caesars of our own making. And they're Caesars that, that are 
these gods that can rule us so very, very quickly because, well, maybe there's two or three of these Caesars or maybe there's a whole populace and a whole citizens of men who go after these Caesars, so they must be right. That's why I believe the theory of evolution is so rampant, even in Christian circles nowadays, because everybody believes it. Like global warming, whatever the scientists say, whatever it appears to be happening. They just believe it because the whole nine yards of humanity is believing it. That's not what faith is. Faith is faith in God revealed in his word. Faith is the faith of a Noah who built an ark and for 120 years and there was no, no rain on the earth even. Faith is living and dying for Jesus. And that's not of the world. And there's powers and there's glories and, and there's seemingly now not only the powers and the glories and the Caesars and the kings and the kingdoms of this earth. They're seemingly now not only, I say, but they're seemingly here forever. You see what this age is trying to do to us? It's trying to secularize the sacred. So there's nothing sacred anymore. You know what secular means? It means here and now. What you see is what you get. It means you're bound to this earth. You're bound to what you can measure. You're bound to what you can feel and touch. No wonder that's creeping into the church. Feely, touchy, touchy, feely. Let go, let God. And there's no appropriation of God through appropriation and enlightenment in this truth anymore. The prince of darkness grim attacks the church and any vestige of faith and any prayer people, and he attacks at all our vulnerable points. And I was going to say, we have these vulnerable points, like the young of the church and the young people of the church and the young couples of the church who are going to set the course for their marriage and their family right now, one way or the other, as they make wise decisions in light of the Word of God. I was going to say that the elderly are especially vulnerable. I was going to say that the ministers are vulnerable and the elders and the deacons because that's where the, the Christ would minister through the church. And I was going to say that parents are vulnerable and single people are vulnerable and those who've lost and those who've gained, they're vulnerable. But you know what? I concluded we're all vulnerable at all of the time. And the devil attacked you to see in the front door and through the back and through the side, and through the windows, and at night, and on Friday night, and Sunday, and every other day. All to leave us faithless, and prayerless, and praiseless, and Christless, but God's people are given faith. And you know what? The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. And when God gives faith, he keeps us in the faith. You believe that? Believe then the testimony of the Old Testament saints who themselves were praising God long before even Jesus was revealed and when it seemed like the glory of the kingdom was dull and dead. Psalm 89, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all its fullness, you have founded them, the north and the south, you've created them. Tabor and Hermon rejoice in your name, you have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Now that's what he was saying long ago, the psalmist. And Old Testament saints were saying something like this, that God's is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And it affected their life, and it affected their praying, and it did not affect their faith, except to build it up. They testified the truth of God, and they were on their knees testifying. New Testament saints as well, history long, and I have to be brief here, is about these prayers whose faith is given and is not taken away, even in the midst of a faithless generation. And that's what heaven will be about. Read the prayers and the praises of the saints in heaven and the 24 elders and those odd creatures who are there of, of whose identity we hardly know. But it's fantastic, is what heaven is all about. And this is the beginning that we have in the faith that is given, joining us to God, so we say, 
Amen even. And that's the point of Jesus when he gives that precious word at the end. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, he says in Matthew 6. And then he says, make sure you say amen. Amen simply means the end. No, it doesn't. It means it's so. Amen is from the Hebrew aman, to be firm. Get the verb to believe from aman. And therefore, amen is, I believe, I'm convicted, it's so. And that's what Jesus wants us to conclude our prayers with. You believe in God, you believe in an amen God. You believe that you've been given an amen faith, something firm. You believe that there is truth and that there is this kingdom and there is this king. He's called God and there is this glory that he will share with no other. And finally, this is my final point. This is all because we're joined to the Savior. Jesus is speaking to children of the Father. He's speaking to believers. He's encouraging their faith as well in him. And that's what we would do in this last sermon on prayer that I will ever make. No, that's not true. There will always be sermons on prayer. And there will always be prayers with regard to sermons. And we are a prayerful church. God be praised for that. But this is for disciples. In fact, we cannot pray this prayer if we are not joined to Jesus. There was a remarkable instance, and I have to point this out to you. I didn't have time to read it here. In First Chronicles 29, when the temple where God met with the Old Testament people was being prepared, there's a remarkable praise that David gives at this time that almost hints that Jesus was alluding to this. In the building of the Old Testament temple that David could not do, but his son Solomon would, David launches into this prayer, and it's almost like Jesus is taking from the words of David, which were inspired by his own spirit, Christ's own spirit, and attaching them to prayer to teach us a very important lesson. David says at the time that the temple is being prepared, when the iron and the gold and the silver and the, all the stones and, and all the money was prepared, he says, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Do you see that? First Chronicles 29, 10 and 11. It reads like a New Testament Lord's Prayer. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, forever and ever. There's David and this people of God. On the occasion of this preparation for the temple, and I find that meaning in light of the Old Testament typology, that all praise prayer worthy of the name has to be connected with where God meets with us, and where God meets with us is now revealed in Jesus. In the Old Testament, as they're building the temple, and as they're reminded that God is their God who brought them out of Egypt, and who is their God today, they're led to praise. And as we now would lead or lead others and would ourselves be in prayer to God, which is praise prayer, remember the temple. In fact, you can't pray as God would have you unless you remember the temple. And I don't mean that earthly building. I mean God with us in Jesus, who's the temple of the Lord, the house of God, in whom God dwells in all the fullness of his Godhead bodily. That's the temple. This temple, this revelation of God with us, that's why we pray this prayer. That's why we can believe God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's why we know we're children. Why? Because the temple has come, the temple is with us, and the temple was broken down, destroyed, and risen again to the right hand of God. And now behold, by the grace of God and through the faith given, you're joined to that temple such that you, church, are the temple of God and His Spirit. That's something. That's why you pray. That's why you praise. That's why you believe. 
That's why we're here to celebrate this great gift of prayer and connection with God and, and the gift and privilege of praise. Why? Because he's made us his temple. And God is with us as we speak, as we hear, and he's leading us in, in this hostile age. He's leading us to the word of God and to sacraments that confirm our faith so that we and our young people in the church coming through the ranks, as it were, can be the church of tomorrow. He wants us, you see, on our knees. This is the desire of the Father. And on your knees, not in despair, but in great confidence, not in doubt. Because what father wants his children to doubt his identity and relationship with them? Not a father who's a good father. Certainly not the heavenly father who says, I want you to know I'm your God, you're my people. I forgive you, I love you, I lead you not into temptation, but deliver you from the evil one, I'm your God. So, people of God, hear this word. It's about the temple, Jesus it's about the Savior Jesus. It's about Jesus now teaching us to pray with him, the eternal Son who would give glory to the God who's his Father, now joining us with him and saying, you sons and daughters, join with me, won't you? And breathe that temple too that I've made in my blood, in my outpoured spirit, the place of prayer, the house of prayer, marriages of prayer, relationships and work of prayer, children of prayer. Be that people, and God be with you. And he will be with you. You know that. Why? For his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. It is our privilege at this time to worship the Lord in the sacrament the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, in preparation for our partaking of that, I'd read from, for us from a combination of the forms approved by the churches and adopted for use in our edification here at Sovereign Grace as follows. And I want you to listen carefully here and make this a true meal time and prepare, preparation for participating in these sacred elements and in the Son and his life as well. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank God that in addition to the preaching of the gospel, our Lord has instituted the sacraments of holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are given to signify the invisible realities of his gospel and to seal unto all who believe the salvation that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we now receive and celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we would pay careful attention to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper as they were delivered to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. And I quote 1 Corinthians 11, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, This is my body which is for you, this do in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh, eateth and drinketh judgment unto himself, if he discern not the body." From this and other scriptures, we see that the Holy Supper is a sacrament whereby we all, in the worship of God, and as we assemble together as his church under the godly oversight and care of Christ's elders, are regularly to remember and honor the death of Christ on the cross as the only propitiation for our sins and as the sure pledge of his return to take us to be with him in glory. In the supper, we are to partake of him by faith, this we do, believing that as surely as we partake with our mouths of the bread and the cup, we partake also by faith of Christ himself, signified and spiritually present in the sacred supper, who himself also speaks to us in the word that is declared. 
We are as well rightly to examine ourselves in our partaking of the supper, and this means we do righteously and humbly concur with the judgments of God's own law that we are miserable sinners exposed to God's wrath unless we are washed by the Savior's blood. We believe the sure promise of God that all our sins are forgiven us only for the sake of the passion and death of Jesus Christ, and we're minded henceforth to show true thankfulness to God in all our life in love to him and to our neighbor. As we would come to the table now, we are to remember that this supper, which is not for hypocrites and those who live without repentance and godly sorrow for their sin, is nevertheless an ordinance appointed by God not to discourage the contrite hearts of believers, as if none might come to the supper of the Lord except those who are perfect. For the supper is given to us exactly because of our weakness and because of our failures, in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the word of God, there is, uh, in the word of God, there is the promise of his favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added the supper to confirm his promise. In the supper, therefore, we are called as sinful and yet freely forgiven children of God to come and to partake and to taste and see that the Lord is good and gracious, for he is that very wonderful God, our Savior, who hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us after our iniquities, but instead, in his loving kindness, hath removed them all for Jesus' sake, as far as the east is from the west. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the holy of holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by the word and spirit, that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through this holy sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity, through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. Through this sacrament, by your own word and spirit, Lord, may these common elements be now set apart from ordinary use, and through them may we be nourished with the body and blood of Christ. Amen. that we may be nourished with Christ, the true bread from heaven. Let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate, who is at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us firmly believe all his promises, not doubting that we shall be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit, as surely as we receive the bread and wine in remembrance of him. The bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. I'm going to read as the elements are being distributed. I'll read first of all from Psalm 42, the well-known Psalm, the great comfort As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise. With a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God.
take and eat and remember and believe that the body of Jesus Christ was broken for a complete remission of all our sins. The cup of blessing which we bless is a communion of the blood of Christ. I read at this time from the Beatitudes. Jesus' words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Take and drink ye all of it, and remember and believe that the precious blood of Jesus Christ was shed for a complete remission of all your sins. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thanks for the blessing of your word and of this holy feast. Although we're unworthy to partake of this sacred meal, you have kindly bidden us to come. And you've clothed us us with Christ's righteousness so that we might come boldly in a feast with joy. Indeed, we do now rejoice, for instead of wrath, we've received your pardon. In the place of fear, we've been given hope. And now in the sacrament, we have been reassured of these blessings and of the truth of our great high priest and mediator of the new covenant, who's reconciled us to you 
and who even now intercedes with us at your right hand. Strengthen us, we do pray, so that having received by faith of Christ himself and his grace, we may now by your spirit and in light of your most holy word honor you with our bodies and with our souls, with a life that is to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Rise now and receive the benediction. Afterwards, we'll sing the doxology 310. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Fitting, we close this sermon or this service when we've heard of the doxology to close with another doxology. Receive now the blessing of God by faith. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.